Good afternoon, Saturn Road family. Glad to be with you in our daily Bible study. As I start off today, I want to ask you a question. What's the craziest thing you've ever done because a friend asked you to do it? Um, something you probably would have never done on your own unless a friend asked you to do it. I'm not talking about that where the friend ask, double dog dares you to do something stupid. I'm talking about because somebody you had a relationship with asked you to do something that you would have never done on your own and took you out of your comfort zone, what would that be? Think about that. We're continuing in this study from great events to great major characters in the Old Testament and the lessons we can learn from them. Uh, but today we're going to be in Genesis 12 if you want to be turning there in your Bible. We started off talking about creation and then we talked about after that beautiful time with God and man there in the garden, there's the fall when Satan entered in and interrupted that relationship. Sin comes into the world and sin progresses to such a point that it says that the inclination of every man's heart continually was evil. And in, Noah, in Noah's story there in Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9, it says that God said, you know what, I, I'm, I regret that I ever did this. I'm repenting of the idea that I ever created man. I'd rather destroy him. But, it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's a very important verse. God decided I'm going to work again through this man, Noah, and his family. We'll start all over with Noah because he is such a man of faith. And Noah exercises that faith by building the ark, gathering the animals, and being submissive to God during that whole time. So today we're going to be in chapter 12. It says this in chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and all people on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him also. And Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot and all the possessions that had been accumulated and the people they had acquired in the land of Haran and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. And Abram traveled through the land as far as the side of the great tree of Morah. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him, and he worshipped him there. The Bible, in my Bible, the heading on this chapter is the call of Abram. This is a pretty big deal. This Abram, who will later become Abraham, is held up by Paul and other writers in the New Testament as kind of the poster child for what faith is supposed to look like. He plays an incredible, incredible role in the story of God and how he interacts with man. But for Jewish people, for the nation of Israel, this is their birthplace. This is where their nation begins. This is their founding father. And God deals with all of humanity on a global scale, but he also deals with individuals, individual people and individual families and individual tribes and nations. And God chooses Abram and makes him a promise. From you, from Abram, I'm going to make a great nation out of your family. This is part of God's plan that we talked about over in Genesis 3 to restore the relationship that was broken by Satan between man and God. This the fall by calling out a family, by calling out a group of people and finally a nation from which the Messiah would come. And that all starts with this call of Abram. We don't use that term call very much in our fellowship. We hear that term most often used by our friends in other religious groups, most often around hiring of a new minister or, or somebody to come and, and lead a church. Brother so-and-so has been called to become our new pastor, our new minister, our new preacher. I believe God works that way. I believe God does send people to congregations uh, at just the right times to, to help them. But I've always found it amusing that God only calls ministers generally to bigger churches and bigger salaries. So I have a little question mark about that. But I want you to consider this idea today of being called by God. Oh, we call by God today. Your homework today is to search I would ask you to search in the New Testament and see how many times that phrase called by God or where, where it mentions specifically that, that we're called by God. You're going to find it a whole lot more than you might think. And it's not just for the big shots. It's not just for the preachers and those kind of people 
for the paid professionals, it's from all of us. Listen to a few of these. Romans 8 verse 28. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Romans 9 says, What if God did this to make the riches of his glory known to the object of his mercy to us, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us whom he has called, not only from the Jews but also from the Gentiles. And then over in Ephesians 4, a very famous verse for us, there is one body and there's one spirit just as you are called to one hope. And when you were called, that's all of us. All of us have been called by God. So when you hear that term called by God, what do you think about? Well, we most often don't think anything about it because we don't use the term. How is that different than what you thought about when you decided to become a Christian or to join a particular congregation? Is that the same thing as being called? Sometimes our response to the gospel, our conversion, I think is, is somewhat too academic, too prescriptive. Someone studies with us and we see from the text what needs to be done and we obey and I think that's good. That's what the text is there for. But sometimes our conversion is more about joining the group, joining a congregation, joining a church, than about accepting a personal call from God. There's a personal part of my conversion story that where I relate to God through this call. We make our decision based on our friends sometimes and programs and preferences for the church rather than thinking about being called by God. The involvement by God in my conversion, my acceptance is not discussed much. My response to the gospel needs to be a personal response to God's calling. We don't acknowledge being called that much and so we don't talk about being called that much. And therefore, we don't live much like we're called either. When I think about being called by someone, by God, or even by somebody else, it means that they've taken an initiative to contact me. They've sought me out. When I think about being called, I'm joining with somebody else in some purpose. There's an intent to the call. There's a reason for the call. There's a plan and there's a purpose for the call. And there's expectations of me because I have been called. I want you to look at Abram's call. He was selected by God. Abram's family. Genealogies there are found in chapters 10 and 11 where it talks about all the begats from Noah all the way up to, to Abraham, about all the family members. But out of all those people, out of Terah's family, he is the only one called. Abram is the one. Not his dad, not his brothers. It's Abram who's called. He's selected. He's chosen by God. The intent, there's a plan. God has something in mind that he needs Abram to partner with him on. And God saw something in Abram that he liked and he made him that call. There's a purpose. The purpose here is to build a great nation. Even though Adam and his wife knew that they were barren and couldn't have children, God knew better. And so, but there's a purpose here and there's expectations for Abram when he receives this call. He's expected to leave his home. Maybe a fine home. I did some research years ago on a place called Abraham's home. It's now located in Iraq. He lived in a big city. There's evidence that he lived in a large city, had a home, a brick and mortar home. And so when God comes along and says, hey, I want you to pick up stakes, sell everything you got, and let's go and live in tents for a while, there's a lot that's required, expected of Abraham. He's going to go to leave his relatives. He's going to leave his place where he belongs. God didn't say how long it was going to take. He didn't tell him how he was going to get there. He just said, leave. And the amazing part is Abram said, okay, I'll do it. Does that sound weird to you today for somebody to answer that quickly and that boldly? Can you imagine Abraham going home to Sarah and says, honey, you're not going to believe what happened today. This, this person, this, this God called me today and said he wants us to pick up stakes, leave the house. And she says, well, where are we going? He says, I don't know. Well, how long is it going to take to get there? I don't know. But we're going. And Sarah says okay, and she goes as well. So she's considered to be faithful as well. She's an amazing person too. This kind of response to a call is not common today. I believe it ought to be more common than it is. When we're called by God, I believe there's an element of faith that's required. There's always an element of faith when we're called. Like that song says, we trust and obey. Uh, look at Hebrews 11, starting in verse 8. By faith, Abram, when he got the call to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, 
even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, when she was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand of the seashore. In Christ, we're part of that seashore. We're part of those grains of sand. We're part of those stars. A call by God always has an element of faith required. It always has some expectation of me when I'm called. And I would also say that there's expectations from God. God will take care of me and God will be a promise keeper because he, that's his nature. There's an old song that we used to sing called I Trust and Obey. And I love that song and it's required when we're called. So if God still calls today, how does he do it? I think he calls us by his word either by personal study or someone preaching the word to you or teaching the word to you. The word of God is powerful and it convicts and it calls us toward God. I think the Holy Spirit is used in calling us as well. As believers, we have the indwelling of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit calls us, nudges us in certain directions, open doors and closed doors, but he acts, the, the, the Holy Spirit moves us in certain directions that God wants us to go. But there's also, if you look in Acts, the 10th chapter with Cornelius, the Holy Spirit has a role in unbelievers who are leaning toward God as well. God also uses other people to call us. God can use other people in Christ to prompt us and encourage us in certain directions or to give us ideas and plant ideas in our mind. That's why it's so important to surround yourself with folks who are led by the Spirit, folks who we believe have answered God's call and can answer the call and help us answer the call when it comes for us. So I ask you, who in your life do you listen to? Who do you have in your life that can help you listen to God? And last, I think he calls us through circumstances. Uh, God arranges things, open and closed doors, opportunities. But these opportunities are always voluntary. They're never forced. You think about Queen Esther when it says, you are called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Those opportunities come along. That's part of God's call. But God, but if she had said no, God would have gone a different direction. It's always voluntary, it's never forced. So if God still calls, why don't I answer more often? Well, sometimes I'm just too busy to hear. I get too busy in my life to, to slow down and listen to what God's telling me. And other times I become tone deaf. If God speaks to me and calls me through his word or through the spirit or whatever, and I continually say no, if I continue, continue to not listen, Eventually, I quit hearing. It just becomes blah, 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 blah. Uh, so we often pray that God give me ears to hear and eyes to see to combat that. Another reason I don't hear sometimes is I don't feel like I'm qualified. I think about Moses, and we'll talk about him in a couple of weeks when he's at the burning bush and he starts coming up with all these excuses why God shouldn't have called him. But here's the bottom line, the reason I don't listen to God's call. I just don't like where God's calling me a lot of times. I wish he'd leave me alone. I really don't want to do what he's asked me to do. I think about Jonah when he says to go to Nineveh. Jonah says, I just don't want to do that. So he didn't listen to God's call. He went the other way. And sometimes when I get this call, it, it moves me out into places where I'm not going to have everything tied down. I'm not going to know 100% of what's going to happen. My plans are going to be interrupted. And I just don't want to do that. God calling me always involves me getting out of my comfort zone. I don't use that term lightly. Calling by God will always call us out of our comfort zones. It's been a while since I've been out of my comfort zone. That's a pretty bold statement, but sadly uh, it's developed over time. I can be active in, as a church member and never answer the call that moves me out of my comfort zone. I can be very comfortable here at 3030 Saturn Road, even though God is calling me to something that might move me out of my comfort zone. Abram had to leave his friends and his family the comfort of the city life versus the, the life in the tent as a nomad. He had to leave the comfort of his routine, the comfort of his schedule, the comfort of his plans, the comfort of his business. I'm going to close today with a scripture out of James, the second chapter, where it's trying to decide. James is trying to do this deal about faith and works. And of course, he has this thing in here, some writing in here about Abraham. 
chapter 2, verse 22. You see that his faith, talking about Abraham, Abraham's faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. I started off today asking you a question. What's the craziest thing you've ever been called to do by a friend? And I used that because I knew this scripture here about Abram being God's friend. They had this relationship that allowed God to call and Abraham to answer even when things were really crazy. Abraham answered God because of that relationship. What might seem crazy to other people, to your friends and your family, is really God's call sometimes. Abraham has proved to us that you don't have to be perfect to answer God's call. Abraham messed up more than once in his life. We're not talking about being perfect, but God still has plans and God still needs people as part of those plans and he still calls us today. What we're talking about today is the challenge of being open and willing to say yes to God and not to say no. Being willing to say yes when the call comes. We, we may never be called to sell our home and move to an unknown location, although some people are and some people say yes. But my answer to his call may be, to extend grace and forgiveness to somebody who's hurt me. The answer to the call might be to turn down a promotion at work because it's not best for your family. The answer to God's call might be to say to someone that needs help yes rather than finding a way to say no. The answer to God's call might be to say no to the world's definition of entertainment and say, I'm not going to participate in that. Those are all answers to God's call. The call of God always requires faith. The call of God always moves us out of our comfort zone but it's always worth it. God is a promise keeper and God takes care of his friends. God bless you in your study today.